Welcome to the Growing Pulses in 2020 webinar on springtime insect pest considerations for southern pulses. My name is Claire and I work with the Birchup Cropping Group and coordinate the GRDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts across the region to increase knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability. I'd like to introduce you all to Dr. Jessica Lai from CESA. Jessica Lai leads extension activities at CESA, a Melbourne-based scientific group known for its activities in insecticide resistance research and running part of the GRDC funded entomology service, PestFax Southern Edition. Jess has been part of the project team since 2018 through which the team provides identification advice, training and seasonal pest and beneficial notifications to grain growers across the region. Before joining CESA, Jessica was a plant biosecurity coordinator in horticulture and prior to that, a researcher in plant biotechnology and animal genetics at Monash University. Now the purpose of today's webinar is to give you all an overview on insect pests for pulses in the southern region, with a particular focus on Helicoverpa, Heliothus, Etiella, beneficial insects, and red-legged earth mite paddock risk monitoring for time right. Um, now everybody in the webinar should all be muted. We will take questions after the presentation. And there is a Q&A window at the bottom of the screen that allows you to type your question in. So feel free to type them in um, during the presentation. You can also check send anonymously if you don't want your name attached to the webinar. The webinar is also being recorded. So if you can't stay for the whole thing or if you have technical issues or you would like to share this, it will be made available on the GRDC YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Now I'd like to hand over to Jess. Thank you. Right. Thanks a lot for having me, Claire. Uh, so as Claire mentioned, oh, we've got a little bit of feedback there. Might be a bit better. Great. Um, as Claire mentioned, um, we're going to focus on a, a, a couple of different pests today and some um, beneficials. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to spend um, a bit of time focusing on Helicoverpa punctidra. It's a type of Helicoverpa um, known as native budworm. Also do a, um, a bit of a reminder about ETL and monitoring, which is quite topical at this time of year, and uh, discuss a little bit about red-legged earth mite um, control um, in relation to um, controlling um, diapause eggs uh, development um, in for a bit of forward planning for next year. Um, so just starting with um, Helicoverpa, uh, many of you would know Helicoverpa species was formerly known as Heliothus. There's a couple of different species that we think about when we um, talk about Helicoverpa. One of them is native budworm and the other one is Helicoverpa armidra. It's also known as corn earworm or cotton ballworm. At this time of year, native budworm um, appears um, more commonly uh, around late winter and spring, um, whereas corn earworm is, is more of a warm weather pest that you'll see a little, little bit later on in the season. In terms of the native budworm um, host range, it's, it's quite broad. Um, it tends to feed on broadleaf plants. Um, and in, in terms of pulses, um, you will find it on a few different kinds, including chickpeas, um, lentils, um, faba bean, uh, as well as field peas. Um, and it will also damage canola and, and lupins. So just a little bit about the life history of the native budworm, um, which is a little bit different from Helicoverpa armidra, the corn earworm. Um, native budworm is known as a long distance migratory species. So um, each year we get these um, flights of native budworm coming into agricultural areas um, on the, um, in Western Australia, but also in, on the eastern coast uh, where we are. Um, and, it, and it does this after breeding um, over winter in the arid interior. So it actually can survive on a range of native plant species, which it does. 
um, over autumn and, and the winter months. And when these plant species uh, start to, to die off, the budworm will take advantage of um, quite strong wind currents coming from the northwest, um, which will blow them into agricultural areas around this time of year. That's distinct from corn earworm, which um, will migrate, but it doesn't tend to be such a long distance migratory species. More often than not, the corn earworm will um, overwinter as pupae in the soil in situ so um, and remain local in an area. And then um, moss will, will emerge in, in late spring, really when, weather's, when the weather starts to warm up. And it's particularly a pest that you'll see over summer. Now, identifying one from the other is quite important, particularly as the weather warms and it's more likely that armidura will be found in a region. As Helicovip armidura does have insecticide resistance to several chemistries, um, whereas native budworm does not. And that resistance to chemistry um, is um, strongly related to its life history. So the fact that it doesn't migrate in and out of a region, it stays in a region in situ um, quite often, um, which means that it's um, more likely to be at risk of um, having a selection pressure placed on it from, from chemistries um, over a longer period of time. Telling apart the adult um, corn earworm and native budworm is not all that easy. As you can see from these photos at the right here, they look quite similar. There's a bit of a white fringe on the hide wings of the corn earworm you can see down the bottom, but it's not a diagnostic feature. Um, what is more useful and easier um, to use is to look at the caterpillars, so the immature life stages. So both Armidura and Punctidra um, share a couple of diagnostic features in common when it comes to the caterpillar life stage. Um, colour can vary, but both of them tend to have a lighter stripe running um, down their bodies, as you can see here. Um, it has these four abdominal prolegs um, in the middle here, these fleshy appendages and, a, and an anal, a um, couple of anal prolegs at the end here. That's distinct from the caterpillar like a looper, which would have just one proleg in the middle there. Um, and also, if you have a look at the back end of this caterpillar, there's a, there's a slope to the end of its body here. There's a sharp decline once you get to the, that last abdominal segment, you can see by this red arrow. And that really indicates that you've got a helicoverpa rather than something like an army worm or, or a cutworm. And the hairiness scale. So when you find caterpillars in your paddock, it's also really useful to have a look at how hairy they are, so how many bristles they have. So you can have very, very hairy caterpillars like um, you see here on the left, all the way through to helicoverpa, which has quite distinct bristles, and then army worm and cutworm, which are a lot less hairy. And the differences between Armidura and Punctidura do exist in terms of their bristles. So Helicoverpa Punctidura have black bristles the entire way down their body. Um, and if you focus on the head region, you'll see that these bristles are black. And you can see this with a hand lens or a, or a macro lens on, on your phone camera. If we look at corn earworm in contrast, it has white bristles around that head area. And these bristles might turn darker further down, but particularly around that head is where you want to have a look. You can see these bristles are lighter. So that's another distinguishing feature. And also in terms of armidra, not always, but often you'll see that you have this dark saddle on its back here on the first abdominal segment. So about a quarter of the way down the body, you can see it's indicated by that arrow. And that saddle is something that you wouldn't see on native budworm. So around this time of year, um, monitoring is underway for native budworm. Um, it's a really good idea to think about setting up some sort of early warning system for native budworm in late winter, early spring, um, which we do uh, at Caesar. Uh, and you can do that with traps using pheromone lures. And it gives you an indication as to when native budworm will be found in a region. Once you do have an indication that native budworm is, is in the region, uh, it's a good idea to start monitoring. Um, so monitoring is really useful because you might find, once you do monitor, uh, you find that you have more mature 
larvae. So the mature caterpillars of native budworm grow to around 50, uh, 40 to 50 millimetres. And what that means is while they might feed on um, leaves, um, they might well be pupating by the time that, that pods form and you, and you enter that high risk period. So they might not be much of an issue. However, if you monitor and you find that you have small caterpillars, so um, for instance, less than 20 millimetres, there might be a chance that they will be still in the larval form and in the particularly voracious larval stage of a mature L, sort of L6 larval form um, by the time pods are developing. Um, and it's at that stage you might want to think about taking control action. So sweep netting is a good way to determine um, your risk from native budworm in spring. So the recommended sampling technique is to take um, five sets of 10 sweeps um, uh, over across the paddock and each sweep equates to around sampling of one one meter area. There is a threshold which I'll go through in a moment. Uh, here it is. So the threshold for native budworm is what's called a dynamic threshold. It was developed uh, for Western Australia by Monjano in 2006 and it allows you to um, use that sweep netting monitoring in conjunction with the cost of control for the season um, and the value of the grain for that season and also the expected grain loss that you would expect from um, per larvae. So if you um, have a look at pest notes on the Caesar or Sardi websites, we have um, details about this dynamic threshold, which is a calculation that you can do in, con in conjunction to sweep net monitoring. And it also contains additional information such as these estimates that you can see here on the top right, which relate to different kinds of crops and the different damage levels expected per larvae. And you can see that faba bean is highly susceptible to damage. So there are um, these days uh, a few different selective chemistries that you can use for controlling native budworm. And we do um, recommend that you have a, have a look at these because of course, a good um, and important part of um, managing any pest in your paddock is the ecology that's already existing there, your natural enemies. If you are looking to control native budworm, small larvae will be the easiest to control. So it's important to cons consider, consider that when, when you're thinking about spray timing. And also be aware of um, the fact that corn earworm does look very similar to native budworm and it is often around at the tail end of the winter cropping season. And so um, being aware of corn earworm um, resistance is also very useful just to make sure you're not applying chemistries to something you think is native budworm but might be corn earworm and might not have an effect. There are a lot of different natural enemies that can impact on a, cat a species like a native budworm. So we, for instance, have parasitoid wasps out in the field that might parasitize eggs. Um, we often get questions about um, the eggs that are shown on, on the top right here. And you can see that these eggs have these eyelashes around the rim and they're laid in these batches on, on leaves. And in fact, these are the eggs of a natural enemy called the spine predatory shield bug and an adult is shown down the bottom here. Um, that's a natural enemy of native bud, budworm. So if you do find these egg masses in, in your paddock, that's uh, an indication you've got some good natural enemy action happening. And we also get reports or inquiries about these, um, these furry masses at the top here. And what these are, they're actually parasitoid um, wasps that have left the caterpillar that they've been parasitizing. Um, and you can see at the bottom that you can see these exit holes from this army worm here where they've exited. And then they've, um, they've formed pupae. Um, and, and they have these furry masses surrounding, surrounding these poopy here that, to keep these egg masses together. So if you see those in the paddock, again, a, a good indication that you've got natural enemy action occurring. And also keep a lookout for caterpillars that, that are looking lethargic or might actually be filled already with parasitoid wasp pupae, as you can see down the bottom here. That's an example of not a budworm, it's a looper that's been parasitized. Etiella is another um, 
pests that you'll find uh, at this time of year. So in terms of the ETLA life history, that's an example of uh, a moth species that doesn't migrate long distances that in fact overwinters in the soil. Um, and then it will emerge once temperatures start to warm up in spring. So usually in September or October, depending on the location. Um, once adults emerge, they might migrate a certain distance. There's not a whole lot known about how far they migrate. Um, but within a couple of weeks, they'll begin to lay eggs on developing pods. Um, and it's at that point that it's really important to start monitoring for these adult moths. Because once eggs are laid and larvae hatch, they can, um, they can bore into the green pods of pulses and begin to eat the seeds. And these caterpillars are very small. So at their biggest, ETLA caterpillars are only about 12 millimetres in length. So of course, the, the very uh, young larval form of, of, of these caterpillars um, are, are quite small and can be hard to see. And of course, once they're hatched and they're in the pods, uh, can't, can't be controlled. So, if you're in an area that you know is a high risk of ETLA and you've, and you've had issues in the past, it's important to know when to monitor for those adult moths. Um, Sardi have developed um, a really useful degree day tool that they've actually recent really, recently released as an app just a couple of weeks ago. So you can see the, um, the web address for the app there and you can also have a look at the Sardi website and find it from there. So the degree day model, um, basically starts to count degree days um, from June 21st, and it will count degree days until it reaches 351 degree days. And it's at that point um, where ETLR will begin to uh, emerge and migrate. Uh, what the model does recommend is that at least two weeks before this peak degree day figure, so at about 300 degree days, that's when you start monitoring. And you can see an example of the interface um, of the um, degree day uh, model on the right here. I've actually just submitted um, location for Swan Hill and it's indicated that around 14th of September, monitoring should have begun. So in terms of monitoring for the adult moth, um, sweep netting um, again, is, is a very useful tool. And the rule of thumb is one to two ETLR moths in, in 20 sweeps of a net is a rule of thumb threshold. So I just wanted to touch also on pest mites in pulses. So there are a range of pest mites that can impact on pulses. Um, and one of the big ones is red-legged earth mite, which tends to be um, a problem during establishment. So you might find that um, during the establishment earlier in the season, you'll be getting these silvery patches on plants. Um, or in the case of something like broberry mite, you might get more of a stippling appearance on, a, on emerging crops. In, in terms of red-legged earth mite, um, in, if, if we're talking about the life cycle, it's a mite that emerges when, weather, when the weather cools down in autumn. And then over the, over the winter months, it will go through several generations where it's laying winter eggs. But at this time of year, something starts to happen to its physiology. It's a little bit different. They'll start to develop what's known as diapause eggs. And it's in spring that we, they, they develop these diapause eggs. Um, the mite itself will die uh, around the diapause eggs and um, give that diapause eggs, egg a little bit of extra protection. And these eggs will, um, diapores over the hot summer months and then mites will emerge when weather cools down again. So it's at this time of year that you might be considering um, to spray on, an, on um, using the time right date in order to limit the number of diapores eggs that are developed and will hatch out the following year. So I've just got some examples of time right dates for various locations on the right here and you can find the time right calculator on wool.com. And the recommendation is that any control in high risk paddocks for red legged earth mites should be carried out within two weeks before the time right date to be effective. Just some considerations if you're thinking about controlling red legged earth mite at this time of year, um, make sure you're controlling for the right mite. 
So there are some mites that look very similar to red-legged earth mite, in particular the blue oat mite, which you can see at the bottom here. There are some um, slight differences in their appearance. So red-legged earth mite has this more black velvety appearance, whereas blue oat mite is a little bit more shiny in, in its texture. It's a bit more blue-black and it has this um, black spot on, the, on its back that makes it look like a red back um, spider. Um, in terms of their behaviour, red-legged earth mite are a little bit easier to see because they tend to feed collectively in aggregate, whereas blue oat mite tend to feed a bit more in singularly. So making sure that you have, um, you've ID'd your mite correctly in the paddock is important when deciding um, if to spray on using the time light date. Also, um, assessing your risk. So not every year is going to be as high risk for red-legged earth mite. Um, it's really um, very, very strongly linked to the paddock history. There was a um, red-legged earth, earth mite management guide that we released as part of a project we're collaborating on with um, BCG and Sardi, and we released that um, last year. Uh, and this management guide has this assessment tool that you can see here. I've just put a screenshot in. And some of the high-risk scenarios to consider about whether to spray on a time right date is whether you have a crop that where you have a, a high legume component, um, if there are a lot of broadleaf weeds such as cape weed around the, the outside or, or in the paddock, if you have a, a thick, dense canopy late into the season to, um, to produce that really humid microclimate for, for, those, for those mites, um, which is just optimal for them. And if you have high numbers of red-legged earth mite, mite and if you're intending on planting a, a higher risk crop such as canola the following season, these are scenarios that would um, make um, impact from red-legged earth mite next season a higher risk and you might consider spraying on that date. But just one other consideration, um, red-legged earth mite of course has developed insecticide resistance to um, OPs and, and SPs. This is in Western Australia, but also more recently, it's been found in Southeastern Australia. A few years ago, SP and OP resistance was found in South Australia, and more recently, OP resistance has been found in, um, in Victoria as well. So that's um, an important consideration. There is a insecticide resistance management strategy available for red-legged earth mite, and you can find it on the GRDC website. Um, or you can find it on the IPM Guidelines for Grains website. It's a really valuable tool. Just and also, about six minutes to go. Oh, great. I'm just finishing up. Um, thanks, Claire. So also when you're thinking about um, controlling for red-legged earth mite this time of year, it's really important to consider the, um, the impacts of spraying as, as usually a spray would be an SP or OP, which is quite broad action. Of course, at, during springtime, numbers of natural enemies are starting to ramp up here. So some examples being um, ladybird beetles, um, both the larvae and the adult forms are, are predatory. Hoverflies, so here's the adult hoverfly on the, on, on the bottom um, photo here, and you'll often see them hovering above crops during warmer weather, um, looking for colonies of, of aphids to plant their eggs in the, in the middle of so that when their larvae hatch, and you can see the larvae on the right here, they're hatching surrounded by a ready food source. So that's quite a common sight at this time of year. As are lacewings. So here's an example of a green lacewing larvae and green lacewing adult. And it has this funny behaviour of placing trash on its back, most probably for camouflage, and that's a good way you can identify a green lacewing from a brown lacewing. So all very useful for controlling populations of pests, particularly pests like aphids, but also um, caterpillars. Um, and parasitoid wasps and tachanid flies that parasitize are also really important natural enemies. And of course, a really good way of finding evidence of wasp activity in your paddocks are these aphid mummies um, after parasitism, parasitism occurs. Or keeping your eye out for those other indicators I mentioned, like caterpillars with exit holes or um, caterpillars that look very lethargic or those egg masses that you can sometimes find in your paddocks. So just to finish up, um, 
So one project we run at Caesar, which is a GRDC um, investment, um, and we run it in collaboration with, um, with partners around the country, QDAC, New South Wales, DPI, SARDI, and, and DPIRT, is PestVac Southeastern. So um, if you want pest advice, or if you have pest identifications or beneficial identifications, make sure you have a look at our website and, um, and subscribe. And I'll leave it there, Claire. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Jess. Um, we haven't got any questions popped up in the chat box, but anyone online, feel free to please pop a question in. We've got a few couple of minutes to go. Um, in the meantime, I, I'll ask a quick, oh, hang on, we've got one. Uh, Jess, how far south have you found the corn earworm moth in the past? Mm. It becomes, it, it's a good question. Um, not, not too far south of, of the Wimmera, although it is, it is variable by season. So it can be found more south. Um, it does tend to be found in, in um, warmer areas though. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll ask one in the meantime while everyone's thinking of their questions. Um, what chemicals, Jess, is the corn earworm resistant to? Uh, so at the moment, um, it's, the resistance has been found definitely to OPs, SPs and, and um, carbamates. There's also been reports of um, low level resistance to chemistries like um, sponosad and, and dimides. So I guess, um, yeah, if you're thinking, of, if you have found it and you're thinking of control OPs, SPs and carbamates are unlikely to be efficacious. Um, and there is a resistance management strategy for corn earworm available as well, and it's worth checking that out. Uh, but I, but I, I guess the, um, the main thing to think about is this is obviously a species like a few others that we have in the grains industry that is just um, readily evolves insecticide resistance um, if it has that selection pressure placed on it. So um, it's, it's really something to keep in mind if we want to keep some of these chemistries available in the future. Thanks, Jess. Um, anyone else got any last minute questions they'd like to pop in the chat box? Um, yeah, we've got one more. Also, when we are sweeping for moths grubs, are there hot spots in paddocks where we should be looking for them, i.e. thickest part of the crop, the flats or the slopes? Uh, some of that will have to do with the prevailing winds. Um, so uh, a species like budworm is going to come in um, on strong, um, often strong northwesterly winds. So if you have a north northwesterly facing slope, something to consider. Um, where they drop into the paddock, um, that can that can result in hotspots. But also, um, whether you have hotspots is going to depend on the mass of moths that that are brought into an area as well. Whether it's a large population or a smaller population. Obviously, once they um, lay eggs uh, and uh, hatch out as caterpillars, they're not going to move very far at all. Um, in terms of density of the crop, something like sweep netting doesn't always work as well for a crop with a um, canopy that's closed over or is thicker, like a chickpea. So to be a bit more... Um, uh, effective with your monitoring, you might want to consider more like a um, beet, beet sheeting rather than sweep netting um, to get a good idea. But it's always really good practice um, to obviously monitor a few different areas in your paddock, so five or six areas to get a, a bit of, bit more coverage. Okay, thanks for that answer, Jess. Um, we've got one more. Have you got time for one more, Jess? Uh, yes. Yes. Is there any augmentation biocontrol being developed? For it native bloodworm? So it just says... Um, I do know that there are biocontrols being looked at for um, corn earworm. 
um, but not available. So, um, but for helicoverpa, obviously there is, um, you know, there's um, biocontrols like nuclear polyhedrosis virus available, and there are others being looked at, but um, none on the market yet that I know of. Okay, so it sounds like there's work happening in that space, but not quite available yet. Um, all right, thank you very much for that, Jess. Um, if anyone is looking for any further information on pulses, the GRDC Grow Notes are a very comprehensive resource. And also the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Projects um, has a number of activities, largely webinars occurring during 2020 to bring you the latest pulse information. Um, we do have discussion groups across the region. So if anyone is interested in being part of those, or if you have any suggestions or requests for what you'd like in the next month's webinar, then please don't hesitate to let, uh, let myself know. Uh, my email address is claire, C-L-A-I-R-E at bcg.org.au. Um, and keep an eye out for future webinars. Thank you very much, Jess, for a great presentation this morning. Um, once you all leave this webinar, you will be redirected into a screen with a short survey link. It has five questions. If you could please answer that just to help us try and make um, the next month's webinars even better. Um, there will be a webinar in October, so stay tuned um, for that. Thank you very much, everyone, for dialing in this morning, and thank you, Jess. Thanks, Claire.